since my last video on Andrew Yang, he has been on absolute fire. After his last debate, he raised a nearly a million dollars in five days from around 80% new donors. So people are really, really digging his campaign. And of course, he went from around one to 2% in the polls to two to 4% in the qualifying national polls. With all his new success, Andrew Yang is taking on the September debate versus fellow competitors like Joe Biden and of course, Bernie Sanders. And people are really starting to take notice on the Democratic candidate who wants to give everyone $1,000 per month. Now, of course, when you're giving around 12 grand a year to every American over the age of 18, some natural skepticism is going to start popping up. And I've noticed that I've seen a lot of different common criticisms, common critiques of UBI, and just exactly how is he going to pay for all that money? So in this video, I hope to answer those questions for you and let you guys know the answers to a bunch of these common questions and common critiques when it comes to Andrew Yang's UBI. By the way, make sure you hit that like button because that's how we really get the YouTube algorithm going and it really supports the channel. My name is Fly Stewie. This is the Uneducated Investor Podcast. We connect investing to pop culture and make sure you subscribe so you can get those investing videos three times a week. But here we go. It's Andrew Yang time, baby. So what are some of the common arguments against Andrew Yang's universal basic income, also known as the freedom dividend. Well, the first one I want to talk about is this. Does universal basic income cause inflation? The thought behind this question is that if you give people money, there will be more money in society and therefore the price of goods will go up. That's because since people can buy more goods, there will be more demand for things like pizza and chicken and beer and therefore the suppliers of those foods or items or goods will up their prices because they can afford to up their prices because people have more money. It makes sense in theory, but the reason why this is not the case is because one of the reasons inflation goes up is a thing called money supply. That's when there is more of bigger or a greater supply of money in the economy than there was previously. A good example of this is in 2008 when the United States Federal Reserve basically printed around four trillion dollars. Four trillion dollars? Four trillion dollars, baby! Did he, did he just... Four trillion dollars into the United States economy. Now, in this period when they printed four trillion dollars and increased the money supply by four trillion dollars, there was no inflation in the economy. Now, the reason why the economy didn't increase in inflation and the price of milk didn't go from five dollars to ten dollars in that time period of 2008 is because people weren't spending money because it was a recession. The demand for milk did not go up because people didn't have any money. So by ejecting $4 trillion into the economy, it didn't cause the prices of the common goods or the consumer price index to go up. So how much is Andrew Yang planning to put into the economy? His universal basic income is $2.8 trillion, which is not $4 trillion, but it still is a lot. However, the $2.8 trillion that Andrew Yang is proposing for the universal basic income, that is not injecting money into the economy as so much as redistributing the money in the economy. That's because he's planning to fund it in two main ways, a bunch of ways, but two main ways. The first one is the VAT tax, value add tax. This will add a tax on business transactions. I actually explain it more in my other Andrew Yang video. And the second is an opt in method where if you're on a social welfare program, you can opt in to the universal basic income, but you cannot receive universal basic income plus your social welfare benefit that you're on. Now, those two methods will cover most, if not all of the 
universal basic income actual funding requirements, which means if there's any government funding to really take care of the rest of the $2.8 trillion, if the $4 trillion in the 2008 recession couldn't create inflation, then of course the rest of the money that's required for the UBI won't create that crazy amount of inflation. And of course, when you really think about it, the income that you're receiving from universal basic income or the freedom in dividend, as Andrew Yang calls it, that income will way more than offset the inflation cost that consumers will face. For inflation to be more than what you would receive from the freedom dividend, it would literally have to be 100% or literally the cost of inflation to catch up with the extra thousand dollars you're getting per month with the universal basic income. Second common argument against UBI or the freedom dividend is that UBI will increase rent. Now, if you live anywhere, especially one of the major cities in the United States, you will notice that rent is literally like skyrocketing the prices of houses are skyrocketing rent is skyrocketing and it doesn't even seem like these cities are becoming livable anymore for the middle class now the reason why this is is because all of the economic job opportunities that really pay you especially if you went to university and got a degree the ones that really pay you happen to be in the coastal elite cities like a new york you know a california any of these major cities has most of the bulk of the jobs now, people who think that UBI will increase the rent in the city are saying that because if landlords know that everyone's making more money and they'll just charge higher rent. The reason why this is the wrong thought to go about this is that for landlords to really all get together and decide to universally increase their prices, they would either need to do one like collusion, which is illegal in all states, or two, have some monopoly in the real estate market, which nobody has. Because this is a beautiful life of capitalism, the rent apartments cannot raise their rents because you would just rent somewhere else. And the great thing is about UBI is UBI might even cause rent to decrease. That's because a lot of these cities that basically are becoming dead cities will actually start to be more viable to live in because you're getting around 12 grand per month. With the lower cost of living like people had in the 1950s, it's way more feasible for you to have a great life and a great income if you're not living in one of you know these coastal cities and you're just living in somewhere in middle America. Th this, this now becomes a great lifestyle that you can obtain in your hometown where you're making 50 grand at your job and 12 grand from UBI every year. With less people migrating to major cities, that means that the rent prices to stay competitive will have to actually remain the same or maybe even drop a little. So UBI is actually something that will keep rent stable or maybe even cause it to drop lower. Third reason why people are against UBI, the one that I hear a lot is that people will waste the money on alcohol and drugs. This one I just find so, so terrible. Like, like when you just really think about it, okay, really think about it. When you hear the phrase, people are living paycheck to paycheck, which a lot of Americans actually are, this is because they actually spend a higher percentage of their paycheck on their monthly expenses. Think about it, if you have to pay for kids, for rent or mortgage, for food, all of these things are hard to do, especially if you only have a 20 to 40 grand salary. Now imagine you're getting an extra 12 grand. That 12 grand is going straight back into the economy because if you're living paycheck to paycheck, you basically have to use or you will need to use a lot of your money to cover the minimum expenses you have. Whereas someone that's super rich like a Warren Buffett or some NFL team owner, guess what? They barely need to spend any of their money to live. Like they spend like fractions of their money to live because their living expenses aren't that high. So when they get the extra money from that big stock deal that they made or that big company merger that they got the deal through, when they make that ridiculously huge bonus, that bonus basically just sits in the bank or sits in a house. Like they, they don't have a need for more money, so they are less likely to spend their money and just put it towards savings or investing. That's why UBI is such a great reallocator of money because by giving more money 
that thousand dollars per month to everyone around America, a big percentage of that thousand dollars is going to go to the bottom percent of income earners. Now, because low income people are way more likely to spend their money in the economy, this will actually boost the economy. It will cause the economy to grow bigger. Now, remember, every time that you spend money, that money is somebody else's income. So by you spending more money, it helps the economy grow. That's why economies go in a boom when consumers are confident they're spending money everywhere, spending money everywhere. And economies go into a recession when everyone gets really tight and they don't want to spend any money. You give money to the people who have to spend money in the economy. It will cause the economy to stimulate because they couldn't even save if they wanted to because they're living paycheck to paycheck. And number four common argument against Andrew Yang's freedom dividend is it will make people lazy and they will stop working. Now this one, I just, mm, just grinds my gears. It, it, it grinds my gears. Like the best way to really understand why this is not the case is think about this. If you grew up with parents, you could essentially never work if you wanted to. Did that make you stop working? If your parents made an extra 12 grand in a year, did that make them stop working? Do people stop working when their spouses make an extra 12 grand? Do they stop working? Now, 12 grand is equal to $150,000 nest egg. That's because if you have a $150,000 investment, an 8% return will give you 12 grand a year for doing nothing. The average person can make 150 grand around 10 years of working, just saving up. So the average person after 10 years of working, do they even stop working when they have a 150 grand retirement fund? Do people from upper middle class stop working when their parents give them a huge down payment to help them pay for their house? Do rich trust fund babies stop working when they go to the best schools of our nations? That's Harvard, Stanford, when they go to these Ivy League schools, do they stop working? I think we have a notion in the society to really look at people who are, I guess, less fortunate than us and really judge them on what they spend their income on. Like you see them, you know, smoking a cigarette or you see them drinking alcohol and you're just judging them because they're like, that money should go somewhere else. But we have to look at ourselves and say, what do we waste money on? You know, countless studies have shown that if you give a homeless person money or you give them literally social housing, those two things are the number one things that help turn their life trajectory around. And this notion that 12 grand will disincentivize someone to work, studies have actually found Andrew Yang's UBI proposal is actually constructed in a way that it will actually incentivize people to work. Remember how I talked about that opt-in initiative? So if you're on welfare, the problem with welfare is once you make a certain amount of money, you don't qualify for welfare anymore. And contrary to people's popular to beliefs, welfare is not something that people actually stay on forever. So UBI will come in as that transition that will help someone going from welfare actually go into the economy and get into the workforce. That is because once they start working, they're now receiving this additional income that if they just got off welfare and got to a job that makes too much, they wouldn't receive anything and they would essentially just be working poor. But now they're essentially receiving welfare with their current income. And because it's the freedom dividend, it doesn't come with that stigma that welfare comes with. Personally think that the freedom dividend is the greatest thing that's gonna actually help and encourage the economy because now it gives you literally the freedom to do something that you actually want to do. I feel like there's so much entrepreneurs out there that are literally in golden handcuffs and can't leave jobs that isn't maximizing their productivity. We might have someone that's working a nine to five right now who makes the best cakes in the world and could have a 10 million Betty Crocker um, cake business that where they do $10 million in revenue a year, but they can't leave their job because they don't want to leave that security because they have a family or that person that can't move to the big city and leave their family behind because they need to stay close to their family and give them that financial security of being there close to them. Or maybe they just can't afford the moving costs of moving to the big city. So because of that, 
you know, they can't leave. That 12 grand would do great for them. The biggest thing about 12 grand, the freedom dividend with getting 12 grand a year, is it gives you opportunities. And that's the main thing that's missing right now in the economy is there's not a lot of opportunities unless you're born into a middle or upper middle class. That is why we're seeing record levels of wealth inequality and we need to start making more policies that actually help the middle and lower class. The freedom dividend is great for capitalism and it helps create that short-term capitalist incentive that you know really rewards short-term behaviors to now help us generate long-term behaviors that will grow our economy bigger without making all these short-term sacrifices like not paying the people of America what they deserve. There's this notion that the freedom dividend is literally free money, but let me just let you know this. The sidewalk is not free money. The hospitals are not free money. And not free money. These are things that you get being a taxpayer of the great nation of America. And the freedom dividend is just another thing that you get as a taxpayer of this great nation of America. You know, this great nation, the great nation of America is the reason why these billion dollar companies like Amazon and Facebook are, got, are even created. So why should like one person reap the crazy benefits of these companies when literally everyone helped build them? I hope in general that this video answers some of the biggest misconceptions, the biggest common arguments against UniBI and the Freedom Dividend. Let me know if you can think of any more or let me know if you disagree. Like honestly, this is a conversation. We're all trying to figure out what the best step for the US is. My name is Fly Stewie. Make sure you hit that like button because of course this video took a long time to make and I'm excited to see Andrew Yang. These debates is crazy. I want to see where his platform goes and who knows? He could literally be the president in 2020. As always, the best, most brightest investors are the uneducated ones. Why is that? That's because the uneducated investor, they never stop learning. Make sure to subscribe, turn that notification bell, bell on. We do investing videos every three days of the week and some political videos here and economic videos here. And we, Flight Crew, have to take off.